Hello and welcome back to another episode of the Everything Antarctica podcast. I'm your host, Maddie Jordan. I'm joined once again by my co-host, Johnny Harrison. And this week we are talking about my most asked question. This is the one I get more than any other so much so that we've also decided to write an ebook on the matter. But if you prefer to get your information through podcasts and audio, we're going to talk today about how to get a job in Antarctica. So, Johnny, it's a very loaded question, but how do we get a job in Antarctica? You just apply online and then next thing you know, you're down there, right? Cool. That's how e- it works. End episode. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot of information to go into, but I thought... Before we get started, it might be worth talking about like what it's actually like to live and work down there. So what are the conditions that we are dealing with? What are we? Yeah, so there's a few good ones there around um, isolation. So it's a very remote place, as you'd imagine. Um, small communities of, of small groups of people uh, all working together. Yeah. A lot of different skills and, and uh, different types of personalities and people. So you've got um, you know scientists that come down. You've got all the support people that go and help them out in the field. You've got cooks. You've got people that are doing cleaning you've got uh, trades people so it's a very diverse group of people um, some of the best things is about it is going down and meeting such diverse people and hanging out with them right definitely yeah and I think it's probably worth while we're talking about this just highlighting that this is not something that's for everyone like not everyone is cut out to go and work in Antarctica and some of the things that often come up are people who don't like the cold if you don't like the cold it sounds obvious but I have seen people who have come down south with a science group or another group or something like that thinking this is going to be a great experience and for whatever reason can't uh, maintain a, an appropriate core temperature, can't manage their temperature, can't keep their hands warm, can't keep their feet warm, um, just don't like winter, don't like the cold. So if that's you, it's probably not the, the place to be. It's mm. probably not the place to go and work. Uh, if you're from the tropics and that's what you like, you've grown up you know, being nice and warm every day, then you know, maybe it's it's something to rethink. Yeah, and, and I guess as well, um, understanding the difference between the summer and the winter seasons in, in terms of the, the social element of it. So in summertime, there's a lot of people, a lot of things going on, and there's a lot more interactions, um, whereas in winter where you end up being very, very remotely isolated and down to those small, small numbers of people that you might only have on station and that's it. Yeah. You don't have flights coming in and going out or, or ships coming in and going out, and so it changes the dynamic once again. So if you find that you're a very, um, you need a lot of social interaction interaction to sort of keep you going and that's what sort of uh, fills you back up um, you're, you're probably not going to get that in the winter months so the same kind of thing as you're sort of men- mentioning a lot of people that um, you know some of them will go down and, and find out that they're just not cut out for the for the social element of it or the lack of stimulation in, in, in that sense yeah yeah, yeah. Um, the other thing to consider as well is when we talk about summer and winter months these deployments if you're working as staff on a research station are actually quite long so if if you've got young families or you've got people at home that rely on you, that need you there, that can't afford to have you away for sort of six to 13 months of the year, then, I mean, that's a completely personal situation and something that you'll have to work through on your own. But consider that maybe if you're at that point in your life, maybe now's not the appropriate time to be applying to be away from home for an extended period. So I find just talking this through with family, friends, your partner, whatever it might be is probably the best way to resolve it and make sure that you're both aligned in your vision or your mission to go and do this but just keep in mind that it's a very challenging environment to be working in and it's made so much harder being away from family and friends and things like that so that's something to consider as well yeah it's also those big life moments right so if you've got like weddings as you've mentioned to before that you missed out on a bunch of weddings while you were down for a winter and so the same thing if you end up yeah. having milestone be- birthdays and things like that those are the things that you just can't uh, zip back and say all oh, right okay I'm, I'm here for a weekend that just that's out of the picture for, for for most people that go down and further to your point around um the seasons uh there are the shorter shorter sort of stints but most of the the time a lot of that work revolved around um, field work and things like that which typically mean that you need either a different skill set or or you kind of need to prove that you've you've sort of you've had some experience down there before in order for it to be like okay this person's good enough to to get out into the field and, and we we know that they're going to be okay and they've got all of the the core skills and competencies down away they go um, and then you might get like a, a shorter stunt out in the out in the field yeah yeah that's very um 
that's a point that's worth noting because not all of the jobs that we get down there are for extended periods of time. There are shorter contracts available, but that's a little bit more niche and does come uh, depending on your experience. So if you've got some, some time under your belt or you're just there for one very specific short objective, then that's a possibility. But if you want to work long term and get to experience things like wintering over and, and the likes, then you are going to need to to buckle up for the long term. And it's also where there's more roles and opportunities, right? So the the base staff, typically there, there ends up being quite a few more of them and, and the roles are a lot more varied. So typically you'd be able to find something um, better suited or, or at least be able to say, oh, well, actually I might not have all of that, but I've got the, the bulk of that and, and I can learn, learn what else I need to. Yeah, cool. The other thing to consider is that there is, due to the isolation, there's a medical process that needs to be followed. So if you're in the position where you don't think you will pass a, a pretty comprehensive medical exam, then perhaps this is something to, to reconsider as well. Um, there are some things that will pretty much rule you out from the start. So if you've had a recent heart attack or recovering from cancer or um, you know have a, a quite a debilitating illness, then you're probably unlikely to pass a medical. There are some things that the medical assessor will look at and say, you know what, we think this is fine for a two month period or you get away with this for a five month period or if your condition is managed with medication appropriately, then they might sign you off for longer periods. But by no stretch of the imagination do you need to be a marathon runner or a super fit triathlete or someone who's incredibly active. Most regular people will pass an Antarctic medical. Some might need to do a few extra things here and there, but medical requirements are probably above and beyond what you would be required to go through for a regular job role. So keep that in mind as well. You don't need to be incredibly fit, incredibly healthy, but you do you do need to look after yourself. And I guess as well off the back of that, there's something to be said around, um, there's often a lot of people ask whether or not you have to have your appendix out before you go. Um, I personally haven't. <laughs> um, and, and I don't think that there's any stations that require that anymore. I could be wrong, but um, yeah. I, I think the Aussies do just for the doctors, sure. or for medical staff. Um, yeah, very difficult to operate on yourself. But yeah, that is a myth that we've actually seen floating around on TikTok and Instagram and stuff like that, that every single person who goes to Antarctica have to, has to have their appendix removed. I've still got all of my body parts. And the wisdom teeth is the other one, right? Like a lot of people say, say, oh, oh you still have to have your wisdom teeth out. And that might be true of some roles in some specific situations. But by and large, um, the, the bulk of people going down, you might, um, yeah, you, as part of your physical, you do your full dental check. And, and that might say, oh, right, actually, we need to look at this or we need to look at that um, but but most of the time if, if you're um if you're fine on that sort of things you're, you're good as going well, yeah you? that's a good point i mean i went through a pretty comprehensive dental examination before i went south for the winter and they looked at my wisdom teeth and they x-rayed everything and they said look it all looks fine it's not going to be an issue for the next year so just leave them in there i did have to have a couple of fillings and had a little bit of dental work done but other than that they were just like oh look as long as you're not going to have any massive issues then you, you should be fine mm -hmm. nice um, the other part of the medical is um, this, and this varies across programs, across countries, and is very different depending on where you're going and how long you're going for. But I also had to do an exercise ECG for winter. So they put me on a treadmill and basically just ran me until they, they got my heart rate up and exhausted me and then brought me back down slowly to see how quickly I'd recover. So there are things like heart checks that are done. They take a lot of blood work um, to check for all sorts of different things. Um, they check movement, flexibility, they check reflexes, just a general look up and down your body. So, um, yeah, making sure that you're you're in a reasonably good state is something that will help you get across the line. And I think as well, it's it's key to actually just identify if you if you've got something going on, just say it because most of the time it's either manageable or it's something that can be sort of oh, okay, well that's that's not ideal. You might not be going down for a whole winter, but that might not rule you out from actually getting a job down there anyway. So I think um, think just being upfront and honest about okay, what are your limitations? Because the last thing you want to do is put other people in, at risk um, just because you're like, well, who I, I managed to get myself down there and, and now uh, we've got to fly a plane down to go and pick you up like that's yeah <laughs> yeah and i often get asked as well about the, the mental side of things so whether they do s like psych evaluations and things like that and when i started my job i went through a psychometric evaluation which was just generally answering some questions and making sure i'm kind of sound of mind i'm not sure um, what it's like for the seasonal roles but um, for the full-time stuff that's what i did went through a general test and they went yeah look sounds good yeah i see they don't do that when you come back from a couple of winters <laughs> might be a good reason for that yeah yeah <laughs> that explains why johnny is the way that he is <laughs> um 
Yeah, so the, the mental side of things as well. Like there's support while you're down there. So there's a lot of uh, a lot of resources that you can draw upon if you're if you're having a hard time, if it's just a short term thing or a long term thing, whatever. There is a whole lot of support around that. But I think that's probably a whole separate episode on Absolutely. talking about um, yeah. how we cope mental with isolation well-being generally, and mental right? well being. Yeah. Yeah, so we'll, we'll address that in, in future. Um, so now we've gone through a bit of the what it's like to be there, you know, what to expect. The next thing is, okay, you've decided that you want to go and work in Antarctica, you think you tick the boxes, where do you actually go to find the job listings? So mm. where do they hang out? Uh, uh, j- jump online. Uh, the old Google search, um, <laughs> you'll probably find a fair bit. And, and I think that's where um, uh, specifically around your uh, nation of origin or or where you have citizenship is probably the best place to start. Where can you actually work? What what legally are you entitled to work at is probably the, the easiest uh, first step. So so go to whichever country's website um, that uh, that you're you're at and and kind of go through that way. And then then potentially there is some options as far as like particularly for the, the Australian program, the Kiwis can apply for that. Um, and so so there's a few few uh, things outside of that. But but by and large, if you if you start there, at least you'll see whether or not okay that's the the simple first criteria really that you need to meet are you legally allowed to work in this country or down in antarctica on behalf of this country and it it sounds very obvious but do you speak the language of the station of the country that you're applying to so for me it wouldn't make any sense to go and apply for the italian research program because i don't speak italian but i do have options with english speaking nations so as johnny mentioned i'm australian i'm working for the new zealand program because when Australians land in New Zealand, we have legal residency and the right to work. So that is another pretty much a non-negotiable criteria. Like, do you actually have the ability to work for the country's Antarctic program that you're applying for? And that's that's key just because it, it ends up shortcutting all of those questions, right? The last thing you want to be doing is putting in an application and then being like, oh, okay, the chances are if somebody's already in that country or if they're already from that country, they're possibly going to just jump that, that queue in front of you um, purely based on that one fact right off the bat. Definitely. So once you've gone through that and you're thinking, yep, this is for me, you obviously need to make sure that you satisfy the skills and the criteria for the jobs that people are actually advertising for. So what are some of those jobs that are available? Yeah, so uh, specifically around Scott Base, but again, uh, most of the bigger stations will have these roles. So um, electricians, carpenters, cooks, cleaners. Um, there'll usually be somebody uh, like a diesel mechanic or something like that kind of role mechanic um, to sort of service all the vehicles and, and look after those things. Um, then there's usually some science support and some IT um, a- along with potentially some admin roles and other bits and pieces like that. So, um, And the other side of this is also the, the field support roles, right? So uh, what have we got in that space? Yeah, so essentially when the scientists are sent out into the field, there's a lot of um, safety protocols that they need to follow and oftentimes we will send someone out who's got all of that experience that is capable of operating in on sea ice or in mountainous terrain and things like that. This is people, this is their job, this is what they do, so it's bread and butter for them might not be for a group of scientists who are very focused on a on a niche you know piece of biology or piece of ice or something like that so we'll often have someone accompanying them in the field to keep them safe and that's the thing right like you're a specialist in your role so we don't expect everyone to be specialists and you know a generalist and and, and good at everything it's like actually yeah we, we employ people to make sure that yep you've got the skills to to look after other people's safety and just kind of be a be a check just to make sure okay well what's what's going on yep all right uh, we're operating in a safe area in a safe way and um, just just basically proves to to everyone that we can get the job done safe right yeah definitely and speaking of safety um, people often ask what happens if something goes wrong if someone gets injured so we do have medical professionals down on site as well different stations have a different level of medical availability some have doctors some have nurses some have paramedics some have a full hospital others just have a small medics room Mm. Um, many people are often trained in first aid as first responders or, or people that are trained in wilderness first aid which is always useful, but generally there is medical support available if it's needed. If it's very serious, we'll fly people back to their their home country or ship them, depending on the logistics of the country. But um, yeah, generally there's opportunities for medical professionals as well. Yep, absolutely. The other thing is kind of roles that both Johnny and I have done, and that's in the leadership space. So each station, while not overly hierarchical, they they 
do have some structure around leadership. So Johnny's been the winter base leader two years, and yeah, it's a it's a pretty essential skill to have, but often is given to someone who's also got another skill in another area. So often taken on as a as a kind of side role or a secondary role. And often that role won't be given to you first off. So often um, it, it pays to have some other kind of experience rather than just running straight into that. And, you know, yep, definitely you could have some other leadership or sort of management experience, but um, actually understanding some of the challenges that are unique to, to the ice, some of those skills you can teach and, and some of them it's like, yep, cool, you can learn. But um, other than that, yeah, you've got, you got to be on the ball from the get-go, right? Definitely, yeah. Um, given that Antarctica is quite a remote location, we have logistics staff as well to help mm. people, or well, to help get people and cargo to and from Antarctica. So there are a few logistics roles available in the airspace. So with air cargo, air freight, air passenger movements, and also in the in sea sea logistics. So shipping cargo, shipping people, all the the things there. So that again varies station to station. If you are based on a continental research station in the middle of Antarctica, you're not going to have to deal with sea logistics. However, if you're on the coast, then that is potentially an option. And that also opens up uh, roles for, for boat operators or or um, uh, flight mechanics and, and other things like uh, pilots and bits and pieces like that. So there there really are such varied roles. And then oh, I guess the other side of that is um, the whole thing of, of runway support. So, yep, how do we actually get these planes down there and, and, and even down to machine operators and things like that to groom the runways and prepare them and grade the roads and, and just look after the general day-to-day power our plant Clear you know snow. there's just oh, there's there's so many different things yeah. that, that need to be done down there absolutely and speaking of flights um that's not just the physical assets that we need to support flight logistics it's also the intangible things or the tangible things that um, some people are very specialist in like meteorologists like what's the weather doing how do you predict if it's going to be a good enough day to go outside or to land a plane or to get a ship in or things like that so um meteorological personnel are available on on many stations as well yeah and the key right because uh, it's um you can't do much in antarctica if you don't know what the weather's doing so it, it uh, does provide such a, a, a crucial role definitely and then if we look towards the hospitality space so johnny touched on chefs and things a little bit uh, earlier on but food is kind of the lifeblood of an Antarctic research station. This is the time when people come together to talk about how their day was, whether they need support from other people, generally just to catch up and just chit chat. So chefs, very, very important when it comes to to feeding the base and keeping morale up. But with that comes cleaning roles and things like that. So there's also uh, opportunities for janitorial staff and cleaning staff that just want to come in and have an opportunity to to get to Antarctica. It's often the easiest way. Um, yeah, just go and go and clean up. And by no means, again, mentioning that this is Antarctica is not really a hierarchical place. Everyone's treated with the same level of respect. A lot of the times, it's the janitorial and cleaning staff that are really enthusiastic about being to Antarctica. They've worked quite hard to get to that position. Mm. Often worked cleaning hotels and dedicated many years to to honing their craft and being standout candidates to to get an opportunity to go to Antarctica. So it's a very feasible option for those who aren't technical yeah. engineering staff like if you're not an electrician then you know this is a it's a very real opportunity it's a and, and like you sort of touched on there it very much is um a lot of these stations end up almost acting as not quite hotel to the level of anyone can come and stay no, no. but but the the amount of turnover and things like that and while um many people might stay on station for a long time there are still a lot of people the science events as they come in and then get get prepped and get staged to then head out into the field they might come in for a couple of nights at a time so then it's it is that whole turning over of a, essentially a, a, a giant uh, commercial space every few days right definitely yeah and it just it creates a really nice environment to be in and and i mean speaking of the environment there's roles for environmental professionals antarctica is obviously a very pristine and beautiful environment and we want to take care of it we do our best our absolute best to make sure that we're not leaving any unnecessary impact so we often have environmental people on on station that We'll go about saying, you know, this activity is is good to go in in line with the approval process that you've been through. So, um, 
yeah, environmental stuff, also pretty key. And off the back of that as well, um, and your background as far as engineers, right? Like whenever we've got any kind of uh, infrastructure or anything that needs to be even thought up or, or changed, uh, adapted, uh, there's always going to be some engineering professionals involved in there and, and also architects at the other end. So, um, And while those roles might not necessarily be based down at, on, on the ice for, for, for prolonged periods of time, um, it's also um, some cool ways to sort of get, get to see parts of the continent and, and kind of get down there so there's there's definitely that side of it as well definitely yeah um safety is also hugely important and safety has so many different tentacles that you can you know you can talk about safety forever there's generic safety with hazardous substances there's safety with machinery there's construction safety there's fire safety which is actually probably something that is worthy of a bit of a discussion so some stations will have a full fire department to deal with fire fire is the biggest risk in antarctica or if not the biggest one of the biggest just due to the dry nature of the environment so fire staff and first responders and emergency personnel to respond to anything that might be going wrong there is yeah is hugely important some people are trained in fire safety some people are professional firefighters depending on what station you're at and and the level of resilience that you need i guess that um ties in quite nicely to um other skills and other things that you might uh, you might pick up or or even you sort of touched on it before around a lot of people having first aid experience and um again if you're sort of you know putting things down on your cv what are those extra things that might be above and beyond just those core roles that you you've got behind you or under your belt um what other what other sort of things can you offer and and bring to the bring to the station definitely that's probably a really good segue into the types of skills that make you more employable so if you are thinking about you know this is something that i want to do how do i make my resume look great what are the sorts of things that i want to talk about in the interview what are what sort of background pieces of information or skills have i got that might help my cause so what are some of those things that you might think about those special skills on top of the ability just to do the primary role yeah absolutely so firefighting is a great one so if you're a volunteer firefighter for your local brigade as well on top or um it could be uh any number of uh you know first aid we sort of just touched on before but it's things as well around like mountaineering um skills and things so if you've got a climbing background or or any of that kind of stuff but um wheels tracks and rollers are sort of I was speaking to somebody uh, last week and they were asking a few questions around it and I sort of said oh well actually um, you know wheels tracks and rollers that's kind of a, a course that you can just go and do and it doesn't cost too much money but it gives you a good level of understanding around how the machinery operates that you might be might end up going down and using so there's um, there's a whole bunch of different little things like that that you can just almost like sweeteners eh, to, to kind of push you above the, the, the next applicant potentially. Definitely yeah one of the things that I found really helpful was having uh, remote working experience and it doesn't have to be remote in the sense of like a polar environment or super alpine or anything like that. I mean, my background was in the Western Australian construction industry, which is is remote, but there are cities and infrastructure around that make it, you know, seem less remote, but it's still in the middle of Western Australia. It's hot. It's far away from major cities, although there are there are cities and towns that you can you can use for support but generally it's considered as remote working so it's being able to problem solve as well right and and adapt to to the challenge but also being able to to find a resourceful way of meeting that challenge there on the spot because as you've just touched on you know the remoteness element of it you, you can't just go down to your nearest hardware store and and pick something off the shelf or or the same thing from a food perspective you know or, or even um uh, health and safety stuff you don't you can't just zip down to the nearest shop and, and go and grab some of this stuff you kind of need to be quite methodical and, and thinking about the next 10 steps ahead rather than just the one that you working on yeah that adaptability to changing situations is something that's so critical you might get to the point where something breaks and you don't have a replacement and you need to you know find someone who's got the skills to maybe lathe something up or machine something or um, just make do with what you've got down there Mm. and I guess as well off the back of that you might have um, skills that aren't necessarily skills that uh, uh, you'll use down on the ice but are are super useful as far as the community element so so things like uh, being able to play a musical instrument Mm. or um, you're really good at doing um, arts and crafts or or you're um, you're you're really uh, keen at playing board games and things like that so um, some of these things that might seem really weird to put down but if you're like oh if you're part of a chess club 
put it down because yeah. it's all those kind of things that actually, oh, okay, this person actually has the initiative to, to go out and look at something else outside of their, their normal work. And, and because it's more of a an, an all-encompassing who are you role rather than, oh, okay, I just want to know that this person is technically competent. It's like technical competence is, is by far definitely important, but it is not the be-all and end-all. Yeah, and those soft skills outside, above and beyond, are, are so important. I mean, I know McMurdo has a Spanish conversation club that if you're at whatever level Spanish you, you're at, you're welcome to go along there and pick up some new words. There might be some native speakers there. There might be people who have travelled extensively in South America. So, yeah, being able to teach people a, a new language is something else that you can do in your free time just to help boost that morale and integrate yourself into that community. Yeah, and I think as well, you've sort of touched on it previously around having gaps in your in your resume and, and just sort of as far as actually put down what it is that you're doing. If, if you are going travelling, put it down there because um, people will be more interested in, oh, okay, so what is it that you actually did? You know, there's there's a whole bunch of skills that go in and, and, and get built around things like when we're travelling that, that might not actually seem applicable, but, but in a role like going down to Antarctica, it's actually pivotal. Yeah, exactly. I had a, a big gap in my resume. I had a... a career sabbatical and went to South America and I initially wasn't going to put that on my resume when I applied because I'm like I you know it was a holiday but it wasn't really there were a whole lot of other skills that I learned how to be resilient in quite complicated situations and how to find your way through and persist through problems and the ability to have something come up in front of you and go you know what I've got the attitude where I know I'm going to be okay and I'm going to push through this and have the desire just to get to the other side is massively important and highlighting that it shows that you know it wasn't in a work environment but that mentality of you know let's find a solution let's make this work let's get to the other side of it with a smile on our face is things that people look at that you wouldn't regularly think about for a typical job interview but just showing that ability that you you want to get stuff done and that you're you're a good person and you're the right person for the role is is massively important and just on that so that's character skills right like and 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 that's one thing that a lot of people won't think is actually hugely important but it is how do we interact with people outside of work how do we um you know what what clubs what might we be a part of or or what are those social situations that we find ourselves in um if, if you're if you're running something you know put that down if you're part of part of a group of people that meets on a regular basis to look at something put it down because what what's the worst that can happen it's like oh well this person seems the recruiter says that it's irrelevant that's fine they they may think that um but but more often than not um showing that you can be part of a community and be be you know entrenched in that um is is huge definitely and especially those leadership roles in those community groups as well so it, i was a part of surf lifesaving in western australia where i used to spend my weekends down at the beach just looking after people's safety and that ticks off you know leadership you're teaching younger people about ocean safety you're helping the community by being there providing support Doing you're risk analysis in risk real time analysis you're dealing with you know emergency responding personnel you're calling ambulances if things go wrong you're putting yourself in quite stressful situations at times so all of those sorts of things that aren't typically what you would highlight in a job application are things that are so critically important mm. Another thing that you really want to have and that Antarctic programs want to see is a genuine interest and desire to work in Antarctica because of Antarctica itself, not because you want to do it for for the money or any other reason. Genuinely, you need to want to work in Antarctica. You need to have an interest in science. You need to have an interest in the environment. You need to you know, support the research and the science that's happening around climate change. You need to understand these sorts of things. If you're not in that boat, then working in Antarctica is probably not for you. You will 100% get asked the question, why do you want to go to Antarctica? And if you are not ready to answer that, you probably aren't ready to go. So um, absolutely listen to things like what we're doing here around giving you more information around what, what actually is going on. Find as much stuff as you possibly can. Read on the history of Antarctica and understand what's going on today and just dive straight into it because the more you, more you learn, the more fascinated you become by it, I find. Yeah, if you can go into an interview and someone asks you, why do you want to go to Antarctica? And you say, I was inspired by Shackleton's Nimrod expedition or I was inspired hearing the story of Sir Robert Falcon Scott and Roald Amundsen's race to the pole and how that went down. If you were inspired by Borschkevink's expedition being the first group of people to winter over in Antarctica, just saying those lines in the last 30 seconds will light up a recruiter's eyes 
and know that, you know what, this person's actually genuinely keen. They're not just doing this because they think it might be fun for six months. Yeah, because a lot of the recruiters uh, are also, you know, really keen on Antarctica and, and that's one of the reasons that they've got their jobs, right, is uh, partly so they can go down themselves but but also um, just to sort of help actually shape what, you know, what the crews will be going down going forward. So, um, yeah, there's, there's not many people that you talk to about Antarctica that go away afterwards and be like, oh, yeah, well, that was great, but I'll never do it again. Um, there's so, so many more people that just absolutely light up and and the more you know the more you want to know definitely another thing is that just because you don't have one of the specific roles that will get you into a position working on the research station there are multiple support staff back in the home country that work to support the people that are on the ground and not all the time but occasionally opportunities do come up for those types of people to go down and have a look so as johnny was just speaking about if you are working with a recruiter who works for an Antarctic program, to understand the nature of the environment and to understand the base that they're working in and to understand the dynamic between people, chances are that person's had an opportunity to go to Antarctica. Mm. So you don't necessarily have to be part of the staff that's there. There are short-term deployment opportunities that will open up for support staff who have been working for an Antarctic program for a while and need to understand the nature of the research that happens down there to be really effective at their job. It's all about that context, right? And so that's so pivotal for building in, in any organisation. And so if you can actually get people down to actually understand what it looks like in, in person, that's just invaluable, right? Absolutely. You know, if you've got logistics staff that are dealing with sea cargo, for them to understand how difficult it actually is to offload containers or to, you know, bring resupply food and you know things into the research station then that's important information for them to have because when the conversation comes up they've got the context they've seen it they've been there they've lived it so there are opportunities for those support staff so don't write those off either yep too good nice one so there are many countries that hire people to work at their research stations and we often get questions about you know i'm from x country can i apply to work in antarctica or i'm from y country do we have research stations so what we're going to do is we're going to talk through all of the countries that have research stations and highlight those that have polar programs as well that might be able to get you down there so if you are from argentina australia belgium brazil bulgaria chile china the czech republic ecuador finland france germany india italy Japan, the Republic of Korea, Netherlands, New Zealand, Norway, Peru, Poland, Republic of Belarus, Russian Federation, South Africa, Spain, Sweden, Ukraine, United Kingdom, United States or Uruguay, your country has an Antarctic program. If you are from Canada or Mexico, you also have associated Antarctic programs without research stations. If you have the legal right to work in any of those countries, then there is an opportunity for you to get to Antarctica. That's incredible, isn't it? You think how much of the world that actually covers? A massive portion. Yeah, so cool. There are a lot of opportunities out there, folks. So to summarise, if we start from the start, the first thing you want to do is work out if you have the legal right to actually work in the country that you're, that you're applying for. Make sure you can speak the language. Make sure you fit the criteria for the job roles that you're actually applying for. Go to the website, work out if they hire people that have the skills that you have got and or if there's a, a job requirement that you could cross train in. See if they have a jobs page. If they don't, contact the organisation and find out where you go to apply for these roles. Some countries have contractor organisations that do recruitment or run the program, so it might not be exactly where you might think to go and look for these resources but just reach out and they'll point you in the right direction review the job description and make sure that you actually satisfy what they're looking for if there are things that they don't need and you don't have the skills go and get them so that you're ready when job applications open if you've got other skills that might be useful that aren't specifically asked for in the job ad also put them down you never know you know where that might get you prep your resume send it off, write a cover letter if that's what your National Antarctic Program wants, highlight the skills that you've got, send your application in, talk to your family, friends, partner, make sure it's all good to go, and then good luck to you. 
one last final thing is um, don't be discouraged if you if you don't get through first go like I didn't get get in my first turn and I know that you didn't either and so I think that um, that's one of the things uh, uh, ask for some feedback and kind of get get the get the why and once you've got the why go on go and work on it and you never know there might be some stuff that you can just sort of sharpen up in the next year and then then go again and good luck to you definitely one of those other things that the Antarctic programs look for is that persistency you know are you resilient are you going to continue to apply despite setbacks because it shows them you know that this is actually something you want to do too good nice one cool thanks for listening to this week's episode of the everything antarctica podcast this is a question that we get all the time so we really hope we've done this justice for you we've got a feeling this is going to be quite a popular episode so to cover that off and in case podcasts are not how you digest your information we've written an ebook it's free we'll post a link to it in the comments down below go and get it go and read it it will provide a bit more information than what we've covered on here today but please go and read the book listen to the podcast share this with your friends let people know if you've had a conversation with someone randomly about working in antarctica direct them to this podcast episode get them to download the ebook and best of luck That's it for today's episode of the Everything Antarctica podcast. Thanks for listening. If you want to find out more about us as hosts, you can find us on Instagram at Maddie K. Jordan and at Johnny Harrison NZ. We're also on socials. You can find us at Everything Antarctica. This episode will be released on all streaming platforms and the long form video will be found on YouTube. Check us out wherever you listen to your podcasts. If you enjoyed this episode, don't forget to subscribe and leave us a five-star rating. This will really help us in our mission to make this podcast as good as it possibly can be. Please share this episode with your friends and social networks so we can spread the word to more people. Until next time, stay cool.